Recording in progress. Hi, everyone. It is Tom and David from Notes from an Artist. Hey, David. Hello, folks. Now, David, I don't know if you watch the YouTube, but uh, there are album reviews out there, uh, people talking about classic rock albums, and we have a classic rock album here. The album is called 10CC. It's a self-titled album because that's what folks did when they made their first record. They named it after themselves. This album was that's recorded... That's how they wouldn't forget... Who they were. Because, you know, musicians are such that they sometimes forget things like that. What's the name of the band? Exactly. We don't even know the name of our own band. That's uh, exactly right. We this, keep changing it, too. This record was uh, waxed in 1972. It was released in July of 1973. The band is 10CC, which is Graham Goldman, Kevin Godley, Lowell Cream, and Eric Stewart. And we're going to talk about this album. But, David, you know what we're going to do? Instead of us talking about it, we have Graham Gulman and Kevin Godley talking about it with us. So shall we proceed? Let's talk about the I first 10CC album. I think that's the best album. way to go about it. Now, you enjoyed commercial success with 10CC's first record. Yeah. Um, how was that for the, how did that affect the band? That Right out of the box, you had a hit record. Oh, it was brilliant. We, mm. we kind of didn't, I think what was great about it was that we didn't actually expect anything. Mm. So... The first record that we had out in 1972 was called Donna, which was going to be the B-side for a song that Eric Stewart and I wrote. But that song was called Waterfall. So we thought, well, we're, you know, being very democratic. Eric and I had written the A-side. Kevin Lawson would write the B-side. And they came up with Donna. But as, as soon as we pretty much started recording it, we knew there was something really good going on. And... Um, we got the record to uh, Jonathan King, who just started a record label called uh, UK Records, mm. and he put it out, and bang, that was it. Now, 10CC were at the forefront of what was developing now as album rock. It wasn't just singles anymore. Um, mm -hmm. How did that affect your writing? Because does that give you more freedom? Absolutely. Everything has to be a three-minute hit single? It completely yeah. changed. Uh, it was like being let loose in a candy store so to speak you know we, we could do anything we wanted also it was our own studio eric was an engineer a lot of the time there were only the four of us in the actual studio itself i think that did contribute to the kind of freedom we felt there was no the only opinions being given were from the band there was no one else to go to and say well what do you think it was just us um and yes because all we did was we wanted to just make ourselves happy so we weren't bothered about being commercial we weren't i mean we were obviously hearing other stuff and listening to people like i don't know the band uh, steely dan just very good quality stuff that we'd always listen to anyway and it all kind of came out and we we also had different influences you know whereas i was more on the backrack side of things Kevin Lowe were more sort of like Jacques Brel or more avant-garde. Mm -hmm. Eric was more sort of bluesy, rock and rolly, if you like. So this coming together happened to work. I mean, it might not have done, who knows, you know, but there was just a great chemistry between us. Uh, actually, when we talk about 10CC, it was actually, wasn't Neil Sadaka the one that suggested that four of you get together because he had liked a song... Uh, ain't, ain't No um, Popo, or something like that, by Crazy Elephant. And then he suggested, because he recorded at Strawberry Studios, which you were involved in. He and did. I think what happened was, prior to working with Neil, we'd been, we, we were kind of the house band at Strawberry. Right. And the house producers, to a great extent, and goodness knows why, but our manager at the time managed to persuade Neil that we might be a good bunch of guys to work with for his, for his next album. Um, I think he was after a kind of simple sound. I think he was trying to not emulate, but do something like Carol King was doing at the time. Right, right. 72. Yeah. And um, so we ended up producing two albums for him, which was great fun. Um, and I think some, sometime during the second album, he said, why don't you guys form a band? And it hadn't really occurred to us because we were quite happy being producers at the time. But we thought, okay, why not? So we, 
we recorded uh, a track called Waterfall, as I recall. Right. Kind of a Crosby, Stills and Nash thing, but it it didn't get picked up by anybody, but we needed to record a B-side. And we recorded this little thing called Donna, right. which everybody felt was more commercial. Um, the Waterfall, and that became a hit record. And everything kind of really kicked off from that point in terms of 10CC. Right, so it was a band that really was never supposed to get together. And just for a minute, we, we, we love to talk about records. Talk about this record, David, which I bought in 1973. Now, for some reason, David and Sam Goody on Long Island, I got a promotional copy. Oh. And one of, those, one of those things emblazoned on here that says rubber bullets, right? Get it for the hit single. So, uh, Kevin, I don't think you got royalties from this one because it was a uh, promotional copy. I don't know how they got away with that. Look at the. Well, I guess Sam there. Goody got money for it, although. <laughs> just that but, one, I hope. <laughs> just that one. <laughs> but um, Rubber Bullets was a number one hit. And, uh, of course, David, the lyrics you can't sing today, we've all got balls and brains, but some's got balls and chains. I don't think you should say that today. You can't say that today? <laughs> we just did. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're on the radio. Um, oh, okay. But Rubber Bullets was a hit. Um, Johnny Don't Do It was a hit. You mentioned Donna, which you call no, Rubber. Johnny Don't Do It was not a hit. Johnny Don't but, but it was a single, yes? It was a single. What happened was Donna was a hit. Right. And I don't know, like a lot of people back then, we kind of thought, well, let's do something similar. Uh, Johnny Don't Do It was, again, a kind of do-what pastiche. Right. But it bombed, died. <laughs> which is one and we recorded rubber bullets shortly after that which did the opposite okay then and was it headline hustler that was a, a single in the united states yes was it i think it was according to my research but that was not a it, take us back if you guys never really planned on being a band this must have been just an exercise in artistry really well i don't know what it was um I, after we had a hit with donna uh -huh. It was like, well, guys, you've got to do an album now. You've got three weeks. <laughs> oh, fuck. <laughs> so, you know, off we went three weeks to write and record an album's worth of material. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I don't know how you feel about it, but a lot of bands, when they start off, um, emulate other bands because they think you know oh god the beatles dylan who know whoever that that's what real music sounds like we better sound a bit like that um i think before recording this first tensus album that's what we kind of used to think like but there was so little time three weeks wasn't long we just we just wrote stuff and recorded it wrote stuff and recorded it and there was no time to to sort of think and consider if it sounded like what we thought good music sounded like. <laughs> and consequently, we were doing the whole thing running on instinct. Okay. And what happened by the time we finished the album, we'd written and recorded a bunch of stuff that didn't sound like anybody else. Um, because we weren't taking notice, <laughs> you know, which is it was kind of healthy thing that, that I've always hung on to. You don't want to think too hard about it. Just just let it come out. And and in this particular instance, because we were so excited and so buzzing on the opportunities that were coming along, we just jumped in and did stuff. And there was nobody looking over our shoulder, remember. We were we were in Strawberry Studios in Manchester, hardly the center of the music business. All right, so then the inmates were running the asylum, so to speak. Yes, that's exactly <laughs> what we were doing. <laughs>